Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given Muslims guidance through the Quran and through the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So a Muslim is guided in his religious affairs through revelation. And if there is guidance in revelation, in the Quran, in the Sunnah, or in the understanding that the Sahaba brought to the surface, then we are honored to be guided. So wealth is a very huge subject in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned wealth in so many different ways. There are many words that are used for wealth in the Quran. One is mal, amwal, which is the plural. And we find that the Prophet Muhammad is addressed in the Quran to inform people with certain phraseologies like tijara. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu al adullukum ala tijaratin tunjikum min adhabin alim. O you who believe, shall I not inform you and direct you towards a tijara, a business transaction, a commercial transaction that is going to save you and deliver you from the punishment. So the word tijara is a very mundane word. It's almost a secular word. It means commerce and business. The Quraysh, as you know, were masters of commerce in the peninsula, the Arabian Peninsula, during that time. They governed because of their ability to do trade amongst themselves and amongst the other neighboring tribes, and indeed in neighboring countries. The Quran swears by the ability of the Quraysh to travel freely for the sake of tijara in winter and in summer, which is an arduous task that traveling in the desert any time of the year is very difficult. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Quraysh and says that Allah has made this easy for you to do business, so they'll go to Yemen and then do business there and have a lot of trade agreements with the people of Yemen and the neighboring country across the sea, which would be now modern day Ethiopia. And they would be able to trade towards the north, go further up the sea, towards Egypt, and into what's now known today as the Sham, the Levant, Palestine, and Syria, and also in Iraq. And they would be able to travel to the other side of the peninsula, towards Oman and other places, where they would have trade agreements with people. So we find that in the seerah of the early Sahaba, they were very savvy with business. And the Prophet ﷺ himself went on an expedition once for Khadija anha, and that's how she found out about his business integrity, his business ethics, and the rest you'll know. So we see that the Quran uses this phraseology of, through words like tijara, business and commerce, so that it would appeal to the immediate psyche of the Muslims of that time. And then the Quran would use that to show that there is another way you may understand business and trade. فَمَا رَبِحَتْ تِجَارَتُهُمْ the Quran says about those who sell their hereafter 
in exchange for Iman in this world. That you want a trade-off, and you are trading your hereafter, what's going to happen to you and your salvation in the hereafter, uh, merely because you want money and a good life here. So the Qur'an then destroys the idea that the people of the Quraysh were good businessmen. So the Qur'an mentions, فَمَا رَبِحَتْ تِجَارَتُهُمْ The tijara was not beneficial, was not profitable. رَبِحَتْ okay. So we see, now it was already in the psyche and the, the, the social milieu of the Arabs at that time and the Qur'an came as a revelation to these people and they immediately understood what the Prophet was saying. So you can see that the Qur'an does not immediately denounce the idea that they had tijara in the first place, or they made tijara, or they did business and commerce. The Qur'an uses what the Quraysh was used to to make a point. And the point being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to benefit, but not just in this world, but also in the world hereafter. So what I'm saying is that the Qur'an uses several words in order to depict the idea of earnings, of wealth, of accumulation, uh, and all of that. So it's a huge discussion, and the Qur'an is filled with ayat and surahs that speak about the human action interaction with their money, with their wealth, and so on. Yeah. At the highest level, we find that the Qur'an encourages the Muslim to go out and seek Allah's pleasure by spending fi sabirillah. So that they sacrifice in the path of Allah. What is mentioned first? Bi amwalihim with their wealth. Yeah. Now, the point I want to make today is that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed the fledgling Muslim community in Medina, in the early days of Medina, developing the Muslim community and the Muslim ethos and the Muslim psyche so that they would be able to represent the final word of God to everybody else that they would be in contact with. So the first thing was that the Prophet ﷺ said to the Sahaba that uh, when you wake up in the morning, uh, you are obligated to give charity for every limb and organ that wakes up with you and it's safe and sound. So the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, how are we going to give sadaqah every morning for every limb and organ? There's about 300 plus at least. So the Prophet said that if you don't have money, then you must smile. Smile is a charity. You must say, Subhanallah, do the dhikr of Allah, mention God's name. That's also a charity. Understand? This is how the Prophet trained the Sahaba to think that we think and believe that if you have money, you can be charitable. The Prophet Wasallam said, no. You are charitable when you have in your heart the desire to give whatever it is you have. Not just money or wealth or capital, but whatever you have. You are feeling good about yourself and you say, Alhamdulillah, and you smile at your brother. And the Prophet says, this is sadaqa, this is charity. If you don't have that either, and you sit down in the masjid, and you say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illa, illa Allah, this is also sadaqa, and this is also charity. So the Prophet وسلم, told the Sahaba that you must not restrict the idea of being wealthy or then charitable to monetary issues and values. And he mentioned this in hadith later on. Uh, 
the ghina and wealth is not measured by the amount of material wealth that you have. Arad. That you have a good house, you have good furniture, or you have a good mount, a steed, a horse, a camel, or you have good clothing. So the Prophet said that ghina, being rich, is not measured by what you own outside of your being, outside of yourself. The true richness of a person is measured according to how rich that person's heart is. Now take this. If somebody, mashallah, has a million dollars and he gives a hundred dollars, mashallah, how is he compared to the person who has a hundred dollars and gives ten dollars? You measure the two? So it seems that in this case, the person who has ten dollars is more charitable than the person who gave a thousand dollars because he has richness in his heart or more richness in his heart. So we see the Prophet ﷺ trained the Sahaba to think outside of the box of what we call the dunya, the world. So outside of this world, of outside of this mundane understanding how human beings should be evaluated, there's another system of evaluation which might be moral, it might be psychological, it might be spiritual, or simply might just be Islamic. To cut through the chase. So, on one occasion the Prophet وسلم, said that you must save yourself from the fire even though you will be given half a day to Save yourself from the fire by giving your brother half a date. So how does one now give half a date and save oneself from the fire? Because when somebody doesn't have even half a date, giving that person half a date is the whole world to that person. And the Sahaba in the early days didn't have very much to eat. They were all poor. Most of the Ansar, they were farmers. And the Muhajir who came, the immigrants who came, they left all their wealth and property in Mecca. So the Prophet said, look, when we are going to develop this community, this Ummah, then it must be developed on some fundamental principles of uh, kindness and charity. And that starts with you. How charitable, charitable are you? So if you make the dhikr of Allah, you are charitable because you are giving to the environment around you that the Allah's name and God's name and Allah's dhikr and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's asma and the sifat and the Quran and all of this, they have an impact on everything around you. And that's how you give to the environment around you. And that's how the Prophet ﷺ trained all of their people. So what I'm saying is that in Islam, when we want to build and develop a community that is charitable, we don't always and necessarily only concentrate on amassing wealth which the Qur'an condemns, by the way. الْهَاكُمُ التَّكَاثُرُ حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ الْمَقَابِرُ This showmanship, upmanship, of showing off to each other, I have more and more and more, hoarding money has distracted you to the degree that now you will only be aware of who you are, what you are, when you visit your graves. So, Amassing wealth, hoarding wealth in such a way that there's no one else in the world but you and your bank account. That has been severely reprimanded by the Quran and the Sunnah. Because that is not the way for any human being to behave and to live where there's no one on the planet except him and him and him. So we see that the Prophet and the Quran, they did not want a Muslim to become niggardly and to become stingy where there's uh, very little room for helping the other. In one of the surahs of the Qur'an, as you 
Mashallah, all of you, at least most of you would know, the Quran speaks about فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاؤُونَ وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ The woe unto be those people who pray because they are showing off and as they show off and they're vain, in their vanity they will deprive the neighbor from even the smallest of favors, ma'un. Ma'un is a small favor. Some of the Mufassirin say like, if you have an egg and your neighbor needs an egg and you say, I don't want to give you an egg, then that is now depriving people of the ma'un. That's the tafsir. So very, this is in Makkah. So very early, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows human beings through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that being stingy with what you have is not the way forward for any human being as an individual and especially not as a community, a society, as an ummah who is going to represent the last Nabi, the last Prophet of all times so that you, you, you do not uh, uh, damage the value of a Muslim civilization. So, what then is the role of wealth as we know it today? As we know wealth today, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ni'mah and fadl is there in the form of wealth. And I said the words that are used by the Quran for this uh, are many, one of which is fadl. After we perform salat al Jumu'ah, which is Allah's fadl, His grace, His mercy, His rahmah, we're in salat. Now, this is Allah's rahmah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says to believers, فَإِذَا خُضِيتِ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ That when Salat has finished and expired on Friday, you've completed your duty to Allah, and that is Allah's rahmah, then you must disperse in the earth, and then seek from Allah's fadl, وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ Seek from Allah's fadl, His grace, and His rahmah, His mercy. Which one? You've already done something in the form of your spiritual service to Allah and your worship. Now go and find Allah's fadl in the form of mundane ni'mah and mundane goods. So go about your business and go about your tijara and see what you can do through Allah's fadl. Meaning, the Quran says when you go out to earn, you are earning Allah's fadl, which is very huge. What you earn is also from God's grace. That's why it's called fadl. So that the human being does not assume that what he earns is his, and God has no portion or part or participation in what he earns and what he owns. The Quran gives an example of one of the most richest men in human history. And that is in the form of Qarun. Qarun was Musa salam's cousin in the Bani Israel. Allah gave him so much wealth and money, we can't even imagine how much money and wealth that could have been. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Qarun, وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْكُنُوزِ مَا إِنَّ مَفَاتِحَهُ لَتَنُوءُ بِالْعَصْبَ أُولِ الْقُوَّةِ That we gave him so much of the treasures of the earth, meaning gold and silver and everything else, that the keys, not his wealth, his treasures, the keys to these treasures had to be lifted by several people who were very, very strong. People of immense strength would be required to just lift the keys to the treasures of power. <coughs> Do you know anybody who has that much wealth? Today? In the world? I don't think so. So the Quran depicts this person, Harun, who is a cousin of Musa salam, and says that we gave him. Again, the Quran says, we gave him. Wa we gave him. 
So then the, the Quran then says, see what happened to him because of his arrogance, his pride, his vanity, and his claim that it was his. The Quran says, this is my man. I have been given this as a result of my earnings and my knowledge and my ability to do trade and commerce and to be a good businessman, etc. And he refused to comply with the laws of the Torah, with the laws of Musa alayhi salam, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we all know, punished him in this world. So, we see that when Allah wants us to go out into the world, then he wants us to realize that he is giving you the ability to do so. And number two, whatever you are earning is his fadl and his risk. That he is the one who has facilitated for you travel on the flanks of the earth. So go forth and walk and then eat from what Allah has given you. Eat from the risk of Allah. The Allah's provisions will come to you if you travel and you earn and you do this. So, the Tawheed is necessary for the Muslim to bring down to their earnings and to their wealth and to their properties and to everything else that they have. Once a Muslim realizes that it is God's will that he is trying to earn and then he is owning <laughs> because ownership belongs to Allah first <laughs> to Allah alone belongs the heavens and the earth Allah owns Allah gave us permission to own only as one of his agents <laughs> spend from what Allah has made you a khalifa Meaning whatever you have earned and whatever you have owned or you own now is a result of God's deputizing you on earth so that you may use and benefit from whatever God has given you. So now, when we look at all of these ayat that speak about earning and seeking God's Rahman and Fadl and Allah's risk and uh, benefiting from whatever Allah has given us, we see a very positive picture about Muslim, a Muslim, and his earnings and his wealth and his property and everything else. And what is that? That you see this as Allah's fadl, and you take care of it, Allah's ni'mah, and then you go about in the world and you take care of who you need to take care of. Now, who do you need to take care of? The Prophet said, Ibda' biman ta'ul, that when you want to be charitable, be charitable to the people that you are raising your own family first not that you want to be spendthrift and you want to be extravagant in your homes or in the way you spend at home but at least take care of them. that you should not be niggardly and stingy in the way you take care of your own family and your own uh, children this is something that we all know the Prophet Sallallahu expressed in so many different ways and the Sahaba also understood this that uh, Muslims uh, they, they, they want to be part of Allah's fullah, a very well-to-do community, and so on. One of the principal reasons why zakat has been mandated, or the benefits, we should say, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want the Muslim community to be poor. One of the most principal and foundational issues with zakat is that zakat is there to eventually eradicate poverty. The Prophet ﷺ did not want the Muslim Ummah to remain poor at the level of the civilization so that they will always be in want. He didn't want that. He wanted people to be able to earn themselves as the owner of the Sahabi who came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked for charity. And the Prophet ﷺ saw him to be a young man, strong and energetic, and he said, that, do you have an axe? He said, no. So he asked one of the companions if he could lend this Sahabi some money to buy an axe. So he gave him some money, he went and he came back with this axe. And then the Prophet Sassam told him that now go and earn living by cutting down wood. 
Now, where are you going to find wood in Medina? It was a, Medina was a forest then. The wood would be outside of Medina. So he said, go outside of Medina, chop some firewood, come back to the market, and then sell the firewood and earn your living. Then he said, this is much better than you asking people. So the Prophet ﷺ did not like the idea that the Muslim state would be a charity state that gives free handouts to everybody. He didn't want that. He wanted every Muslim to be independent and have self-pride and esteem so that he would say, I'm not going to ask anybody, I'm going to ask Allah and I will seek from Allah's fadl to do what I need to do now. This is how the Sahaba went. Some of them made a lot of money, like Uthman radiallahu and Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. So much money, Allah. Some of them not so much, but they were wealthy enough to feed themselves and others, like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Umar radiallahu anhu. And some others had to work harder, like Ali radiallahu anhu. But you do not find a single instance where you see the Sahaba would come to the Prophet and say, Ya Rasulullah, Please give me some money unless it was a traveler. It was somebody from outside of Medina. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says, Abu Huraira, the one who narrated the most ahadith from the Prophet sallallahu says that when I came into Islam, I would sit with the people of the Sufa who would be in the masjid because they couldn't find any work. And they would dedicate their lives to learning, listening from the Prophet He says that I would roll around in the dust of Medina, where young children would think that I had gone mad. Out of hunger. Out of what? Out of hunger. This is the Sahabi who narrates the most hadith from the Prophet on one occasion, he asked the Prophet ﷺ if there was anything to eat. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I don't have anything in my house to eat, but we can go and ask somebody else. <laughs> All right. What I'm saying is that the, 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 I'm not talking about, the, I'm talking about the psyche. Okay? The attitude of every Muslim was to be independent. Unless it was very, very overwhelming. And burning. The Prophet ﷺ did not call people into Islam promising them an immediate opening in a job. If you become Muslim, I'll give you a job. No. So, anyway, so this leads to the idea of zakat. <coughs> the idea of zakat was that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the doors for Muslims, there was not a single Muslim from Yemen to Medina during the time of Omar who was eligible to receive zakat. Think about it. And Mu'adh ibn Jabal who was the governor of Yemen, he sent a lot of wealth to Medina. And he told Umar, Ya Umar, this is all the zakat from the people of Yemen, and we have no one to distribute this wealth to. It's your responsibility as Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Khalifa of Muslims. Uh, you take care of it. I don't want it. Right. Can you imagine that the state of New York is giving handouts to the state of California? So we have so much surplus wealth, take care of it. I don't think so. Omar sent it back. He said, I have no one in Medina who can receive zakat either. So Mu'ad said, okay, fine. The next year Mu'ad said, please don't send it back. Here's another load of wealth that's coming your way. What I'm saying is that the Prophet ﷺ and Islam, this whole thing is there so that Muslims are well to do and they don't need to look over their shoulders. But what was the reason why they were well to do is because they all spent and they all shared and they were generous. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ told them that you don't have to own a million dollars in order to be charitable, in order to be generous. You give what you can at that moment and that is your responsibility in front of God, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is what makes you rich. What makes you rich is not the number in your bank account. What makes you rich is you, inside of you, what's in your heart. 
And when you have a civilization that is based on generosity, not only in terms of charity to others, but also in terms of accommodating others, the Prophet said, من كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليكرم ضيفه. Whoever believes in Allah on the last day, then he should honor his guest. Now, what does this mean? What does this mean? That in those days, the guest didn't uh, book his ticket three months in advance. In three months, I'm coming to see you, my dear brother. And the dear brother says, maybe not three months. Give me another month. I will be ready in three months. My wife says, no, not in three months, four months. In those days, guests came unannounced. In the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. And you were never prepared. <laughs> MashaAllah, Allah, have rahmah on our ladies, MashaAllah, that they want the house to be spick and span when any guest comes into the house, which is fine, wonderful. There's no doubt in that, it should be that way. But when the guest comes unannounced, then what do you do? The Prophet ﷺ said, take care of them, honor them, respect them. Okay. That this ikram that you give and you show to the guest is part of your generosity, is part of your charity. So Muslims have always been known as very, very generous hosts. In our civilization, we've always been known as very generous hosts. Why? Because this is the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, the sunnah of the Sahaba, that whenever somebody comes to you to your house, you present to them what you can at that moment. Because now you're generous. But if you tie your generosity and your accommodation to the idea that unless you have three dishes and five dishes, and this done, this done, then that ikram goes away. Then there's a bit of sophistication there, there's a bit of vanity there. So, the Prophet instructed the Sahaba that if you believe in Allah and the last day, then honor your guests. Why? This is part of your civilization, this is who you are. And everybody comes unannounced in those days, even until about 30, 40 years ago. Right? That if you didn't have a phone or if you didn't have the means to send a, I don't know, telegram, telegraph or fax to somebody, you would have to show unannounced. And then it becomes difficult because now nobody in the house is happy and this guest is here and he's an impediment to my life. Why is he here? Why is he here? And usually if the guests come, they come with the whole family. So what is this? Muslims never freaked out when they had guests. Why? Because they believed in Allah on the last day. When Muslims stopped believing in God and in the last day, then they start freaking out. It's magical. So, let's, let's put this together again, all of us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses very positive words to describe wealth. The most positive word is in the Surah Al Adiyah, وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٍ That with regards to khair, man is very, very strict and severe, intense, shadeed. The word khair is used there. The only meaning of the word khair in that ayah is wealth. And the only meaning. Why? Because the surah talks about the best commodity in the eyes of the Arab. Which was? Horses. More than camels, they valued horses. You all know about Arabian horses, the pedigree and all of that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses this in Surah Al-Adiyat al, -Adiyat al, -Adiyat al -Adiyat. It's all about horses. After the discussion of horses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, khayri That man with regards to khair, which is wealth, is very intense. He is so submerged in wealth and khair that you could not part, that you, you, you could not uh, separate the two even if you were to kill the man, Shadeen. 
what I'm saying is that the word khair is used. Khair in Arabic is just juxtaposed against shab, evil. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has shown Muslims that there is nothing wrong with wealth in of itself. Where does the problem occur? It occurs with the person who assumes that it is his wealth. That's where the problem is. <coughs> now for the Muslim, because he believes in Allah and the last day, he doesn't assume that is his wealth. He <coughs> assumes that Allah has deputized him, made him a mustakhlaf, a khalifa over his fadl and his risk, so that he may benefit from it himself and his family, his neighbors, the community, and the rest of the world and all the relatives. Then there's no problem. So the problem is about attachment and detachment. The Quran mentions in a very unique way. When we read the Quran, we see not only insights into the human psyche, but we actually find guidance, hidayah. There's hidayah for those who want taqwa and to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the Quran depicts a community that is so much in love with Allah, more than their own commerce and business and wealth, that uh, their money and their values do not distract them from the dhikr of Allah. That there are men, Rijal, upright, forward thinking. That neither their commerce nor their buying and selling distracts them from the dhikr of Allah. That as they are engaged in the dunya with the world, in the bazaar, in the market, their only concern is Allah's dhikr. Now some of you will say, well, this means salat. The Quran says no. Why? Because the next sentence is about salat. An dhikrillah wa iqari salat. That they are not distracted neither from the dhikr of Allah nor from salat. Wa'ita is zakat, nor from giving zakat. So salat and zakat are separate from the dhikr of Allah. What is the dhikr of Allah? That you are consciously aware that Allah is looking, Allah is watching, and your tongue is now speaking the names of Allah, mentioning Allah's words and names. This is a community that is the ideal community in the eyes of God. The whole ayat after ayat al nur speaks about who lives in these homes and houses that are raised and they're seen as very noble homes. In these homes and in these houses, there are men and there are people who are committed to the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though they have wealth. And even though they have commerce and business, even though they trade, and even though they are busy with their business and their whatever it is, their mundane world, or now they call the secular world, whatever you like to call it. Now these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commends that nothing disturbs them, nor distracts them from the love of God, from the mention of God's name, from being God conscious and aware of the fact that I have to do this the right way, not only ethically and morally, but also legally and spiritually, I have to do it the way. The Anbiya do this. The Prophets, they do this in a different way. When you look at the Prophets, you'll see that some of them were not wealthy, and some of them were very wealthy. Some of them were not wealthy, and some of them were very wealthy. Dawood and Suleiman 
Alayhi wa salatu salam, very, very wealthy Anbiya prophets of God. They owned kingdoms. They're rulers. They're almost like kings. But they were not distracted from the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to show mankind that is not <coughs> what you have in your possession, is where your heart is. If your heart is with Allah and God, then your money will not destroy you. Your wealth will not destroy you. Why? Because the time you have to pray, you'll pray. And the time you have to give so the zakat and the sadaqah, you will give. The time you have for your own regimen of reading the Quran and the ibadah, you will do that. You'll be organized in your mind in such a way that you will say that money is just a means to an end. It is not the end. And that is the bottom line. As Mawlana Rumi rahimullah, has very aptly given this, this metaphor. That is like a ship on an ocean. If you allow the ship to sail on top of the water, then the water is beneficial because it takes you from one shore to another shore. So the water is beneficial. But if you allow the water to come into the ship, then the water is harmful. It'll sink you. It'll drown you and all your passengers. Likewise, Mahal Rumi says, if you allow your vessel in this life to sail above wealth, and the world and the dunya, then it will get you from A to B, from one shore to another. Be smooth sailing. But if you allow the world and the dunya and your wealth and everything else that comes along with it to penetrate your heart, then the same wealth and the world will sink you. It will drown you and you will not reach your destination. And that is the beauty of the Qur'an. So I started with saying the Qur'an uses many words for wealth. Stijara, acquiring wealth, rizq, Allah's provisions, fadl, Allah's grace and mercy. In this ayah, khair, which means all goodness. Why are these words so positive? So Mawlana Rumi sums up this question by saying, it is positive in the sense that you need water in order to travel on a ship. That's why it's positive. And then the hadith comes, the sunnah comes to tell you and warn you that if you allow it to enter your heart or enter the ship, then it is no longer beneficial, it becomes detrimental. And that is how the prophets, والسلام, especially our prophet Muhammad وسلم, saw the world. Now, big question in seerah. We all love the seerah. Alhamdulillah. We all love the seerah. May Allah send blessings upon the Prophet. Now, the we always say, the Prophet Sassan did business and it was the reason why Khadija السلام, married. It was fine. After Nabuwa, prophethood, he did not do any business. After Nabuwa, the only business he had was Nabuwa, the work of Nabuwa, the work of prophethood. He didn't go back there. He allowed the Ummah to do it, but he didn't go. At the time of Nabuwa, he was a very wealthy person because of Khadija. Very wealthy. Extremely. Some scholars say, historians, that one third of Makkah's wealth was under Khadija's disposal. Her authority. One third. And the Prophet was always with her, so he was also privy to all that wealth, and he was well to do. Very wealthy, very well to do. So he wasn't averse to owning anything. He already owned everything. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
We found you to be in need and want, so we made you rich through your marriage with Khadija. That's the time of Nabu. Very rich. So nobody could say that he was a pauper. Nobody could say that he has now claimed to be a Nabi of Allah of God because he wants money from people. He didn't need to. Allah already gave him enough, more than enough. <coughs> so now, after Nabuwa, as he practiced his prophethood as the only work he ever did afterwards, then by the time he died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he passed away, what did he have left? Nothing. Nothing. Aisha radiallahu says that the week in which the Prophet sallallahu left this world, they had to borrow oil from one of their neighbors. They had to borrow the oil. Now you see the question? On one side we are saying that the purpose, one of the many objectives of zakat is to eradicate poverty. And we see our Nabi sallallahu himself as being someone who did not own anything when he died, when he passed away. How do you reconcile? Then there's a dua on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Allahumma ahyini miskina wa amitni miskina wa hshurli fi zimurat al-masaki Allah make me live with the masaki, with the poor. Allah give me death. As I am poor, Allah resurrect me with the poor on the day of judgment. So what is this? So you have the seerah on one side. This is what the Prophet was at the time that he left this world. And on this side, you see the Quran and other hadith saying that, you know, there should be no poverty in the Muslim Ummah, which is the reason why we flourished. We cannot have become the civilization we became because we were poor. Is that correct? How do you think we ruled and governed half of the known world in that time? Was it because we were begging on the streets? Or was it because we were administrating the resources of the world? That makes sense? The question. But then our leader, the Prophet Muhammad when he left this world, he had nothing. Reconciled. And that is where sometimes, unfortunately, some people, uh, they become confused. They want to follow the sunnah of the Prophet, so they mean the seerah, and then they somehow don't read the other parts of the Quran and sunnah where we are asked to become a civilization that gives and doesn't take. As I said, we were hospitable all the time. When you read Ibn Battuta, you know Ibn Battuta? <laughs> In his Rahna, where he traveled the world on miles for free. He was the most frequent traveler for free, ever, in human history. He hardly paid a dime wherever he went. All the way from North Africa, all the way to India and China, and, and then back. What did he have? He didn't have American Express. He had three miles. Who gave him the three miles to travel so many thousands of miles for so many years? His Muslim hosts. Wherever he went, he was hosted by whom? By us, the most generous civilization ever. You are a guest, welcome. You stay here for one day, a night, two nights, three nights, fine, wonderful. Sometimes some of the village rulers would accommodate him for weeks and months, and when he would decide to leave, finally, he would decide to leave. Okay, I've had enough of this village. No? They would send him off with gifts and money. Now who can afford that lifestyle today? No one. It is because of the infrastructure of this very, very rich 
civilization that we found Ibn Battuta to become Ibn Battuta. Very rich. He writes. He writes in, in one of his uh, logs. I went to Dimashq. Allah save and protect Dimashq today. Damascus in Syria. As I went to the markets, and then one day I saw, with the corner of my eye, somebody carrying a broken plate in his hand. So I'm looking at this uh, person. He's well dressed. He's well dressed, mashallah, alhamdulillah. And he's running with this broken plate. So I follow him into the alleyways. And when he reaches a certain place, he goes into what's called something like an office. As he's going into the office, I, I follow him and says, this office is for seven people. I don't know who they are. Then he comes back out with a plate which is not broken, but very similar to the plate that was broken. So somehow he replaced it. Ibn Battuta is standing there scratching his head. What's going on here? So he says, I went into the office and I asked him, what do you guys do here? He said, this is an office for slaves that if they break anything in their master's homes, they may come here and claim damages. <laughs> and they may replace anything they've damaged because we have a stock of everything that they need. So this person who broke this plate, we had several plates similar to that. We gave him that one. He go. Now, does this sound to you like a poor civilization? Or does this tell you this is a very rich, organized, sophisticated civilization? It's a no-brainer. All the way from the Atlantic to China. You know about the Czech? The word Czech is an Arabic word, sak, sadka, and it's the same word. This meant that if I gave you a note in Morocco, that I will pay you this much if you give me this amount of goods in China, then the Chinese businessman would honor you and he would send the goods because he knew that you would send the money across this land bridge. Nowadays you have other ways. You can do it with the click of a button. Transaction. But the Muslims developed this ability to do commerce and tijara and business because the Quran gave them the impetus through the very unique wordings and <coughs> phraseology that the Quran uses, khair, fadl, Allah's rahma, business, tijara, all of this. That's on one side. On the other side, we see the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he left this world without owning anything. So people who say they want to follow the Prophet so then they look at this side. And people who want to rule and govern, they look at this side. So there's a tension. Hence the question that is posed by many Muslims, which is not really a question, it's a commentary, is wealth evil. Is there evil in wealth? Anyway, the original question that I had proposed was that, does wealth preclude us from being good Muslims? So the Quran says, no, that if you develop the ability to make the dhikr of Allah in any situation, whether you're doing business transactions or whether you're working in the fields and you're constantly engaged in the dhikr of Allah, then the Quran commands you as the true man. Nijal. The true man. That you're the true human being because you know your time on earth is limited and this business is a means to an end. It is not the end. And only God gives. No one gives. Human beings are instruments and agents for God to give. And if for some reason this instrument and this agent and this company and this corporation or this ruler decides that he's not going to give you and you seek Allah's fadl elsewhere. Allah is everywhere as we see and as we know. 
So this is how the Muslims were. The ability of the Muslim to travel freely and frequently was one of the reasons why we developed into the civilization that we developed into. Anyway, so to answer the question. First, number one, that we don't always use every incident from the seerah to make that story in the seerah into a sunnah. Very critical. This is what the scholars say, the difference between hadith and sunnah. Like the difference between seerah and sunnah. So what the Prophet ﷺ did for himself is specific to him. And there are many reasons why he chose to be miskeen. The Prophet ﷺ said that the poor person will enter Jannah 500 years before the rich person does. Because the rich person will be held accountable for the money and wealth that God gave him. And he will be audited. So when you have a billion dollars and you're audited, how long does it take you to file your tax returns? A few decades, I have to see Even then you won't file them. Or you'll show them. Why? Because you've been audited. All this money and wealth that you have uh, accumulated and hoarded now tells you that you have a lot of accountability. So the Prophet said that I want every person in my ummah to be able to follow me. If I acquire all the wealth in the world, which if he made dua, he would have been answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have given him the gold as much as Mount Ahad, even more. But what would that do to the ummah? The ummah will say, we have to follow our Nabi who is extra, extra wealthy. And is that possible for every human being? No. It is not possible for every human being to be a millionaire and billionaire and trillionaire. Is it possible for every human being to worship Allah without owning too much? Yes. So he did this for the ummah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't want my ummah to feel the burden of following me if I have a lot of money. Because then the Ummah will say, we must follow the Sunnah, we must follow the Sunnah. So now, if 90% of the world today, they live in poverty, can they make this excuse that we can't follow your Rasul and your Nabi because your Rasul and your Nabi are as rich and we are poor? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this club of Islam universal and accessible to every human being on the planet. Whether that you are rich or poor, whether you are educated or not educated, the Prophet ﷺ was kept a Nabi Ummi for this reason, or also that he was not able to read or write. So those who don't know how to read or write are still able to follow the last Nabi. The last Nabi, if he had been a person who read and wrote, then the Ummah would have said, What? We need to be able to read and write because our Nabi was able to read and write, and then the majority of human beings, even today, they don't know how to read and write. Now you can say that's not good, that's part of your civilization, but that's a different story. That's a whole different seminar. It's a whole week's workshop. We're not going there. What I'm saying is that how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the last Nabi is where we find our inspiration that the Prophet Sallallahu said he wanted to be with the poor people so that whoever is not rich is able to follow him, just as the person who is rich is able to follow him. The lowest common denominator is what makes the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu the last Nabi. This very ingenious ability of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, I was very rich one time through Khadijah at the start of my prophethood. But when I finish, I want to make sure that I'm not part of the elitist group where it's a members-only club. I want my membership for my ummah 
to be based on nothing except true conviction and declaration of the facts. La ilaha illallah Muhammad So when you bring that into the whole construct of wealth in the Quran and Sunnah, then you say, SubhanAllah, only Allah can do this. And only Muhammad sallallahu can be a Nabi because he actually thought through it. That's why we say Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The conclusion is wealth in Islam by default is seen in a positive light. It is not seen in a negative light. What brings the negativity into wealth is human behavior, human action, interaction, and a lack of action, and reaction. So we see it is up to the human being as an individual and as a community to make sure that they are charitable. And in Islam, as I said, the Prophet ﷺ said in so many words, you do not need to own so much in order to be generous and charitable. Even a smile is charity, as the saying goes. Even say, SubhanAllah, is a charity, as we know. Even helping your Muslim brother do something is a charity, as we know. So now, in this country, when we are pitching for funds, we inevitably gravitate towards money, assuming that money is the only resource and capital with which we will succeed. And we say that's very far from the truth. Because with your money, you need to spend your own self. Yujahidun fi sabiillahi bi amwalihim. And then, and for saying, you need to spend your time. If some, mashallah, millionaire, billionaire gives you a check of a million dollars, subhanAllah, take it with both hands. And then give me some too. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that until the human capital is valued and the human being who gives is part of the community, the community will not succeed. Period. All Muslims must participate in the events of the community where is needed, whenever is needed, however is needed. And there are ranks to that. And that is where our richness comes from. The richness comes from us being the wealth. A masjid is rich when? Alhamdulillah give every masjid plenty of money and barakah so that they're able to create this kind of infrastructure. And this masjid also. But when do we say that the masjid is now successful? What does the Quran say? Does the Quran say if you have a billion dollar endowment then your masjid is successful? Does it say that? Anywhere? No, the Quran says إِنَّمَا يَعْمُرُ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَقَامُ الصَّلَاةِ وَعَدَ الزَّكَاءِ وَلَمْ يَخْشِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ إِلَى آخِرِ اللَّهِ That the masjid is going to be successful and frequented by whom? By those who believe in Allah and they establish salat and they give zakat and they fear no one except Allah, etc. When the masjid is occupied by people who pray five times a day as much as they can in Jama'ah, that's when we say the masjid is successful. When the masjid are events and, and programs for the community, that's when we say the masjid is successful. So it's not just the money. It's not just the... No, you have material wealth in the form of financial wealth. And you have human wealth. What is human capital and wealth? People who come and do salat. People who come and participate in the affairs of the masjid. That is human capital. That's your wealth also. And this is how we see that the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was the most successful even though they had no carpets and they were just praying on the mud and rocks and stones. And it's only later on, during the time Umar that uh, Tamim Dari uh, came and he brought some candles from somewhere and he put candles in the masjid and then Uthman عنه, extended the masjid and then the extensions began but what I'm saying is that during the time of the Prophet وسلم, the Sahaba saw the masjid as being successful because they were there 
The masjid is always going to be successful, inshallah, Allah make this masjid successful in every uh, sense of the word, inshallah. So, my uh, understanding is that wealth in itself is good because the Quran uses the word khair. It does become polluted by human action, human failures. So it is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you use it, you're okay. If you abuse it, you lose it. This is what we must take home, inshallah, from the, this, inshallah, presentation. And if you have questions, I think we have some time for questions. Jazakumullah. Assalamualaikum. So we'll start with uh, questions on the mic, and then we'll take written questions as well. Uh, we have a card, so I'm going to pass this along to the sister section first. Uh, if you want to just raise your hand. Shy. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you, you went through quite a list of ways of doing charity. Uh, there, there was a list of about six I wrote down. Uh, there, there's one that you didn't, one type of, it's like a charity. Uh, people call it social justice. And social justice is knowing that our neighbor needs our help. So during the, the black, when the blacks and, and, and so forth, or I mean like right now a lot of the, the Muslim thing and the, uh, uh, the immigrants and so forth yes. and the poor. So it's changing the system, social justice, trying to work for a better system. Is that, how does that fit in with the other types of charity? Because it seems like in both cases, the incentive or a big incentive is to help our needy neighbor. And you can help either by giving him a check or you can organize and get people together and, and get the government or whatever to make for a better system. Sure. Well, that's a good point and definitely it, uh, my intention to enumerate the various types of charity was not to be exhaustive. That these are the only forms. There are so many others, as you pointed out. One is being kind to your neighbors and uh, one of the statements of the Prophet in so many different words says the same thing, that uh, if you know your neighbor is hungry and you sleep, then you don't have faith. So security for the neighbors and the neighborhood is, is part of your, your community building. And um, you know, if, if you look at the demographics of Medina during the time of the Prophet وسلم, you will see invariably that most of the neighbors of the Muslims were Jews. They weren't all Muslim. There are a lot of pockets of Jews in every neighborhood. And uh, the Prophet always encouraged the Sahaba, the companions, to be kind to their neighbors. So community building works and st starts with being uh, careful and cautious and caring for your neighbors and the neighborhood. Because that promotes peace and security whereby you are going to be able to pray in peace. You don't want your neighbors to be acting funny when you pray. So that, I mean, you expand it to the level of what you call social justice. Uh, but that's a term that we, we, we say that injustice is everywhere, whether it's social, political, economic, or educational, doesn't matter. Justice is justice. But yeah, you're right. That could be seen as one form of charity. We should do zikr while we work. How does one do work uh, with zikr, I think? When the work is mental in nature. It's to be aware of who you are, what you are, your consciousness and the surroundings around you. That's a form of zikr. Obviously, you don't want to be preoccupied with your dhikr when you're, you know, working on a patient um, on the uh, hospital theater slab, you know. 
you give me uh, five minutes, I'm going to go into my mood and mode of liquor. And by that time, the patient's dead. So yeah, with a grain of salt. Uh, be practical about it. But the idea is to be aware that you are doing God's work as you are engaging with the whole cosmos when you're doing this work. So it has a very holistic appeal to the word liquor. I don't suggest that you don't focus on the work at hand, otherwise, as you know, nowadays everything's case sensitive. You could destroy the whole world if you miss a beat. You don't want to do that. But dhikr means that you're aware of who you are and your surroundings, and you're aware that this is God's name and this is Allah's fuddle on you. Question from the brother side. Um, yeah, Allah khairan for the. Um, lectures. I just have a question in terms of um, nowadays there are so many problems in the Muslim community in Syria in everywhere people that need help and assistance even here locally there are people that are still homeless and things so let's say there's a Muslim that is doing charity or is doing if it does sadaka from time to time. So, but do we have a, can we sincerely, I mean, can we have a clean, clean mind and a clear mind to go and buy like an expensive car, a very expensive car, and be driving it around? So, knowing that these problems are still not solved and there are still people around who still need, who are still needy. So, it's not as if one is not spending at all, one is Pending, doing charity, but one is still living affluent in an affluent way. Is that would that be okay? Yeah, if it's not okay, we'll all be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the Sharia says that when you earn something, wealth, then it's yours. The onus is on you how you spend it. The Sharia says that this much of zakat is mandatory on you. And whatever you do in excess is nothing, is sadaqah, is charity. You can give as much charity as you want. There's no limit to that. At the same time, the Prophet also said that you must not uh, forsake and neglect your family because that is also seen as another form of charity that you're taking care of your family. That, if that means that uh, someone wants to buy a nice car, then so be it. There's nothing technically wrong with that. There were voices during the time of the Sahaba, when the Sahaba were given riches uh, from the world, during the time of Umar al-Uthman, many forms of wealth, came to the Sahaba in Medina, there are some voices who are uh, saying what you're saying. That they didn't want the Sahaba as a community to start living a lifestyle that shows that they need some forms of luxury. So the other Sahaba would tame them, calm them down and say, okay, do they have the legal prerogative to spend or not? That's the first question. If you say that they have the legal prerogative to buy a car, which costs 50000 60000 whatever, then you can't blame them if what they do is halal. That's the first rule. Secondly, if there is a dire need in any community, and the trend is that uh, if you don't support the community now, then you might be guilty of a certain form of nifaq or hypocrisy, then your question will be well taken at that time. But for someone to say that I'm going to give 80% of my earnings to charity, that's a voluntary act. It's nothing. He may do that, obviously, at the risk of uh, some uh, comments from his families, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Be careful what you do. Uh, there are repercussions to that also. But there is no legal harm. Is there a moral obligation? Maybe, maybe not. Only Allah knows. 
uh, whether that is moral or immoral. We're not going to necessarily comment on that because it may lead to uh, certain strands and strains of communism and socialism, which you don't want to do, that everybody has to be equal. Okay. So the rule in Islam is that every community should take care of its community first, the local community. Then you expand outside, unless they're relatives. If you have relatives in other communities, other parts of the world, then they have a right to your support and help and, help and uh, your, your wealth also. Okay. Give the relative his due in your wealth. So that you must give, so that you remain charitable. At the same time, as I mentioned also in my, in my presentation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet وسلم, they, they want Muslims to become independent in of themselves. That they're not always looking for other forms of charity all the time. Which, you know, then, then, then you have to weigh which one is more important than now. Or the crisis in the Muslim Ummah, may Allah help the Ummah in every way, inshallah, and we should help definitely. There's, there's no doubt in that. We should help and we should feel the pinch also. Charity doesn't mean that, Alhamdulillah, God has given me so much money, I'm going to give five dollars to the Syrian orphans. And that doesn't cut it, brother. <laughs> feel the pinch. Okay? Feel the sacrifice from your pocket. Stop spending so much on futile activities. Don't be that vain that you can't afford maybe a hundred dollars more, maybe a thousand dollars more, maybe five thousand dollars more in the year. Because uh, hoarding is not liked in Islam. Hoarding is condemned. So yes, from that point of view, your case is strong. So we'll make this the last question, and then we'll learn about uh, Dar Qasim, and then we have uh, Isha for in 10 minutes, so we'll give you an opportunity to go to Wudu if need be. In this time, there are many needy people Masajid, schools, educational institutions, refugees, rights, etc. Which one takes priority? It is difficult to give you a list of, in, in, you know, priority number one, two, three, four. Um, this is how the Quran informs us. One is that if we have relatives who are in need, we must help them first. Why is this mentioned so many times in the Quran? Because it's the most difficult community to help. We all hate our cousins and brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws and in-laws. <laughs> right, try giving your mother-in-law who needs your help some money. It doesn't work, brother. <laughs> it's about the nafs. Take away the nafs. You're not giving for your nafs and your pleasure. You're giving for the sake of Allah. They are related to you by blood, so honor that because Allah has made that relationship for you. You didn't choose that, it's decided for you. <coughs> That's why the inheritance rules are very strict in Islam. Who inherits and who doesn't? It's based on blood relationships. So, if there's a relative who needs your help, then help them first. This is the order of the Qur'an. Then your neighborhood, your local community needs, you should help them. And then other needs, depending on your priorities and so on. Your local masjid first, other masjid later your local school first, other schools later, etc., and so on, if they are local. If they are national, then you must give some weight to the national causes because they influence everybody. Right? And if they are international, then you, space is, uh, you must uh, spend some time thinking about where you want to give, but obviously nowadays because of this, you know, this uh, new administration, we have to be careful where we're sending our money, and you don't have to be careful. Follow the law of the land. That would be my advice.